around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Good evening, friends. David Langford, and we'd like to welcome everyone to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Before we begin this evening, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for your prayers, your love, your financial support for this ministry. I want you to know for certain, we do not take you for granted. We are very grateful, very thankful, and humbled that you would stand with the voice of evangelism. As you know, we never take time to make appeals for finances here at the ministry. We believe God has called us. We believe God has touched us and anointed us to preach the word of God. Thus, we believe God will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory through his son, Christ Jesus. And let me say thank you again for your support for this ministry. You are never taken for granted. That's why everyone that gives a gift to this ministry receives a note from this ministry. And I'll always put a little hand-signed note down there uh, that I hope speaks to your heart and speaks to your life. Amen. Many times, if people don't hear back from us very quickly, they'll phone us and say, did you get my gift? I haven't gotten your letter of thanks yet. And that's very humbling. And we're very grateful and thankful for that. Let me say also tonight, I'm going to begin a new series. This new series is entitled, Has America Become a Harlot Nation? Has America become a harlot nation. Let me be very honest with you. I'm going to be very pointed in this series. This series will last for quite some time because we're going to exegete the entire second chapter of the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to say some things that may disturb you. Some things may even offend you. If you are a Christian and you hear the word of God, and you hear the word of God preached under the anointing and inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and you will realize what I'm saying is the truth. I'm not here to patty cake. I'm not here to pamper, pat, and protect you from the truth. I am here to tell you the truth. Without a doubt, there is a famine of the word of God in America. Oh, there's a plethora, a plethora of preachers but hardly anyone today ever preaches against sin and the degradation and the debasedness that is overtaking this nation. This nation is saturated in iniquity. And throughout this series, I will say things. If you are not careful and a mature child of God, you may find them to be offensive. Of course, I will do nothing that is sinful. I will only preach and proclaim the pure, unadulterated word of the Most High God. I want to take two verses in this beginning here in Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Again, I want to use for a subject title in this series, Has America Become a Harlot Nation? In a very pathetic and impassioned rebuke for their shameless idolatry, Israel is likened to an espoused wife who has forsaken and abandoned her husband for a promiscuous, adulterous association with men, thus making her a common prostitute. This is exactly what Elohim meant in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, when he said, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So many people today 
profess to be blood-bought, born-again children of God. But according to the fruit, according to their lifestyles, they've taken God's name in vain. When you take God's name in vain, it doesn't mean to take God's name and damn something. It means to take God's name and say you are a Christian and then fail to live by the dogma, the doctrines, and the tenets of his most holy word. America has been filled with fake Christianity, and many have taken God's name in vain. They curse, they swear, they fornicate, they get drunk, they smoke pot, they do so all sorts of ungodly things, and yet they will say, oh, but I'm still a Christian. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Because there's a famine of the word of God, many newly converted Christians don't know how to live right because there is a famine of the word of God in the land. And God prophesied that through the prophet Amos in Amos chapter 8, verse 11. For the days cometh, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. As a mature Christian, having now come back to the Lord in 1978 as a young man, I've been serving God faithfully for over 44 years. I have a voracious appetite for the word of God. I love him with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength. I've given my life to Christ because he gave his life for mine. I owe a debt that I could never pay, and he paid my debt, which he did not owe. Thus, I owe him so much, every measure of strength, whatever measure of skill in ministry that I may possess, it is all to him, and to him be all the glory. But today we have a, a, a modern Christianity and a sloppy, greasy grace and a thin playboy religion and ideology that advocates that you can live any way you want to live and still inherit the kingdom of God. That is not biblically sound. It is not correct neither. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Let me say emphatically, it is God's will for you to live right. It is God's will for you to lay aside every weight and every sin that will so easily beset you. Sin will trip up your gait and your walk in Jesus Christ. You have to forcefully lay aside everything the world has to offer you. The church should be like the old patriarchs in the Old Testament. They had faith. When you read Hebrews chapter 11, every one of them, even Rahab the harlot by faith, believed God. And not only was she saved, but her whole house was saved, and she became a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There is so much profuse compromise in the church and in God's Word today. Many take God's name in vain. In holy matrimony, it's when a woman marries a man. They are joined together in marriage. And the woman takes her husband's name. And if she later becomes unfaithful and prostitutes herself, she took the man's name in vain or in a worthless manner. That's what's happening in America. A lot of people today are taking the name of Jesus Christ in vain. Jeremiah chapter 2 is an expose concerning Israel's whoredom and Israel's apostasy. Israel had committed fundamentally two evils. They had forsaken the fountain of living waters. And secondly, because of their idolatry, they had hewn out cisterns broken cisterns, cisterns that cannot hold water. And as a nation, they were forced to drink polluted waters from the cracked and contaminated man-made cisterns. This is what's happening in the church today. 
Many people are drinking from man-made cisterns. You cannot make a cistern to hold the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is supposed to live in us. We are to be the clay jar, the earthen vessel, wherein the power and the presence and the Spirit of God abides within us. When men make human man-made cisterns, they cannot hold the Holy Spirit of God in any capacity. And when we have hewn out man-made religious cisterns, God withholds the rain. I'm talking spiritual rain. God withholds the copious amounts of the Spirit of God that he wants to pour into our lives because I want you to know this. The Holy Spirit of God will not become defiled. The Holy Spirit of God will not become sullied and soiled and stained with sin in this wicked world. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 3, Therefore the showers have been withholden. There hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, and thou refusest to be ashamed. I'm ashamed of some of the things I witness in Christianity. I'm ashamed as the church prostitutes its relationship in Jesus Christ. I want you to know something tonight. The church, the body of Christ, is not a harlot. It is not a whore. It is not a, 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 a vile, wicked vessel. But the church, the body of Christ, is literally his holy body, amen. And yet somehow we believe we can defile, soil, and sully the, sully the church, the body of Christ, and still be right with God? That is not possible. But that's the era and spiritual condition that America is in today. Today the church is drinking from these contaminated, man-made cisterns which cannot hold the fountain of living water, which is none other than Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said in John 7, 38, He that believeth in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Friend, when people come to your church, when people come to the house of God where you attend, do they feel can they sense, can they ingest the fountain of living waters, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of God? The church should be a place where copious amounts of the Spirit of God can be felt, where people can be filled with the Spirit of God, where people can be baptized in the Holy Ghost of God. There was a time a hundred or so years ago, when you walked into any church, whether it was Baptist or, or Presbyterian or Methodist or, 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 or an Assemblies of God or Church of God, they were just coming to fruition at the turn of the century. <clears throat> but when you walked into those houses of God, you felt something because you felt the very presence of a living God. You could feel the Holy Spirit of God the Spirit of God would move in the, in the prayers of the saints. The Spirit of God would move in the music and the, the musicians and the singers. And the Spirit of God would truly move in the messages that were being heralded and proclaimed from behind the sacred desk. And that anointed Word of God, anointed by the Holy Ghost, would go across the congregation like a tidal wave and people were touched and people were reproved and people were rebuked and, and people were convicted of their sins. And when the man of God would make an old-fashioned Holy Ghost heartfelt altar call, people would come and they would prostrate themselves at the altar of God with tears streaming down their faces saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, restore me. God, take away my sins. God, take away my iniquities. God, remove my wretchedness. God, move, remove my misery. God, make me whole. And God would do it every time. God will redeem. God will restore. God will revive. He will revamp. And that's why it takes the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in our churches to see a move of God. Let me say this. America's churches will never see a great mass 
soul winning move of God until the Holy Ghost comes back to the church. Do you hear me? Until the Holy Ghost of God comes back to the churches, you're never going to witness and behold a massive move of soul winning here in this hour. It takes the Holy Ghost of God to convince men and show them they're lost and they are undone and they need Jesus Christ. Man-made cisterns are symbolic of false religion. What is false religion? Religion is when men elevate their seemingly human importance and their human significance. They exalt that rather than acknowledge the divine sovereignty and lordship of Christ. You see, the church today has become so carnal, it's about elevating the man in the pulpit as some kind of Hollywood personality. I'm not a part of Hollywood. I'm not a personality. I'm just a servant of the Most High God. The focus is to never be on the messenger. The focus is to be on the message, the anointed message, the anointed word of God, which is none other than Jesus Christ himself. But Jesus said this in the 15th chapter of the book of Matthew, verses 8 and 9. He said, this people draweth nigh to me with their mouth. They honor me with their lips. He said, but their hearts are far from me. But in vain do they worship me. Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. He said, don't take my name in vain. And then he said in the New Testament, they worship me in vain. They took my name in vain. They claim they're this and they claim they're that. But there is no fruit. There is no fruit of my Holy Ghost Spirit manifest in their lives that they might produce edible, spiritually edible fruit for the world. Church, the world needs a touch of God. I said the world needs a touch of God, and we need that touch desperately. Do we realize the desperate need that's in the church? The church is so emaciated. It's, it's full of malnutrition. It's cotton candy and Skittles and fluff and stuff and popcorn and peanuts and candy. But the church of Jesus Christ it's not that. The church is full of the meat of the word of, living, of the living God. Humanism. Let me preach here just for a minute. Humanism will always oppose the lordship of Jesus Christ. I remember back in the early 80s when I, I was evangelizing and I would visit churches. I've preached in hundreds of churches throughout the nation. And I begin to witness as people begin to bind and quench and grieve the Holy Spirit of God. I was in a particular revival and the pastor had asked me to go on. And I was struggling to minister because there was so much sin and degradation in the church. And I remember as I was on my knees in prayer in the pulpit after one of the services. And I said, God... Should I continue in this revival? Should I stay with this church and stay with this preacher? What do you want me to do? I wanted to know what God willed for my life. And God is my witness. The Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I found the answer in verse 9. But they shall proceed no further. For their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Their folly shall be manifested. He said the church is full of folly, as theirs was manifested. Well, who was Paul talking about here in 2 Timothy 3? That was Jans and Jambres. They were, the, they were the magicians and Pharaoh's court when Moses threw down his staff and it became a serpent. They said, oh, we can do that too. But they didn't have the true God, Elohim. They didn't have Jehovah in their lives. They had another spirit, a false, fake, deceitful, duplicitous spirit. So they throw their rods down in front of Pharaoh and said, see, we can do the very same thing. But the difference was, hallelujah, Moses 
serpent turned and consumed their serpents. And then he picked up the snake by the tail and it turned back into a staff representing the word of Almighty God. That staff that Moses had in his hand was symbolic of the word of the living God. It was symbolic of none other than Jesus Christ having all power in heaven and in earth. And it consumed their folly. It consumed their foolishness. And after the Lord revealed that to me, I told the pastor, I said, God has released me. He's told me to go back home. I need the rest. People today are, are so full of folly and frivolity. Church has become a mere joke. I told you in the beginning of this new series, has America become a harlot nation? I would say some things. I would do some things that may be offensive, but I promise you I am preaching to you a pure, unadulterated message from the word of Almighty God. I will not water God's word down. I will not make it palatable so people don't get choked on it. I'm going to preach what the Holy Spirit of God lays upon my heart. When I grew up as a little boy, I was lying in bed last night. And I was reminiscing the old-fashioned Holy Ghost altar services. My God, and we had altar workers back then. If you went to the altar back when I was a boy, back in the late 50s and 60s, when you went to the altar as a sinner or saint, there were altar workers, and they kept you in that altar till you got everything you needed. If you were saved, they said, we want to keep you here till you get the Holy Ghost. They stayed with you. They prayed with you. They clapped their hands. They, they were hungry for God, to, for God to bless you. And all we hear about now today in the modern church is religious, contemporary, rock and roll slash Christian music. There's no such thing as rock and roll Christian music. There's no such thing as country western Christian music. It's either spiritual or it's not. Ephesians 5 and 19, Paul said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart as unto the Lord. I remember as a boy when when trios and quartets and soloists would stand up and sing and the power of Almighty God would fall from heaven in those sanctuaries. Why? They were singing a Holy Ghost anointed songs. They themselves were anointed. They were in the Holy Ghost. They were in the Spirit of God. And that anointing would flow from them across the congregation. Tears would stream down the saints of God. Tears would stream down the faces, even the sinners. I remember one Sunday morning when I was pastoring in Charlotte. We were singing the, the old hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. What a time that will be. Singing, shouting, and rejoicing. And, and I noticed all of a sudden, several people just got up or walked out of the sanctuary. They were all standing. We were singing a congregational. And, and, and several went out on this side and several on this side. And I'm thinking, well, what in the world is going on? I hadn't even gone to the pulpit yet. And I just stood there myself and I kept singing and I kept worshiping. And there they went out the back door. And about three to five minutes here, they came back in the, the, the back door. And they walked up to the front of the church. And you know what they did? They laid packs of cigarettes on the altar. They laid packs of cigarettes on the altar and cigarette lighters. And I remember after the service, I went to one brother. I said, what happened? He said, oh, when we were singing, when we all get to heaven, what a time that will be. He said, and I said to myself, you ain't going to make it because you're not living right. He said, the Holy Ghost smote my heart. I said, you go get them cigarettes and you put them on this altar. There was a parenthetical time after I had built the new church in Charlotte. I kept a trash can up there beside the, the communion table. And I said, this trash can is offerings for Baal. This trash can is offerings for the devil. Cigarettes, tobacco, whatever you chew, whatever you dip, rock and roll music, whatever you want to bring and put in this altar and offering for the devil, you bring it up here. And I not have to dump it so often. It would get full of junk, sinful stuff. I'd have to take it and empty it and bring it back and put it back there. Where is that dynamic move of God in our churches today? It's not there. 
And that's what makes me believe somehow America has become a harlot nation. Our churches are full of harlotry. Our churches are full of spiritual whoredom. Our churches are full of detestable, despicable, abominable things. And that's why you can't see a move of God. You can't see a witness, a, a manifestation, a demonstration of the Holy Ghost. You have to have the Holy Ghost in the church to see these dynamic, powerful moves of a sovereign God. God, my friend, has not changed Malachi 3, 6 says, I'm the Lord and I change not. God is not going to change. I don't care who is the general overseer or the general superintendent of your denomination, your organization. God is not going to change. You, you can, you, the, the, the Methodist church right now, God bless their souls, are in one of the greatest spiritual upheaval of their, of their lives. My grandparents were Methodist in the 20s, and they left because they were looking for something more. What were they looking for? They were looking for a greater, more deeper move of the Holy Ghost of God. My grandpa told me back in the 20s, the Methodists, they preached against smoking and drinking and dancing and movies and shacking up and all of those things. But he knew deep down in his heart there was more of God. And he began to search and ask people, Somebody said, well, you may want to go over here on this mill hill. There's a church over there where they speak in tongues. Go over there, you might find what you're looking for. Well, he did. A little church of God in a mill village. Mill hill. But God was there. God was there. My grandparents raised me. I come from a broken home, but I know what it means to be raised in a home, in a house where the Holy Ghost would show up even at the breakfast table when they begin to pray. They would utter Holy Ghost utterances even in a breakfast prayer. Church, we got to get back to that. We got to get back to the old-fashioned ways. I know you, some of you say, oh, you're so rotten, you're so old school. With the condition of America, we better get back to old school. We, get, we better get back to the altars. We better prostrate ourselves and humble ourselves. If we don't, America is ripe for, the judge, for judgment. America is ripe for judgment. But if we pray and seek God, God can turn this thing around. God bless you. Join me again this time next week and be blessed of the Word of God. Amen. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.